What's it like to have morning sickness? How does a woman feel after she has a baby? Obviously, Reza and I don't know, so today we're speaking to someone who does. Welcome to... Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. Hello and welcome to the podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. My name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And today we're very happy to welcome to the podcast our friend and colleague, Lynn, who works in the same school as us. She's also a teacher and she's very qualified to speak about today's subject because she has a family. Hi, Lynn. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Craig. Hi, Reza. Hi, Lynn. How's it going? How are fine. you? I'm fine. Thanks. So how many children do you have, Lynn? I've got three, three daughters. Okay, well, we'll be looking forward to hearing all about the birth of your daughters later. But before we speak about Lynn's experience of giving birth and pregnancy, let's look at some words connected to giving birth. Reza, what do we have? Well, probably the most basic phrase you need to know, collocation, is to be pregnant. So you are pregnant, to be pregnant. And that's an adjective, pregnant. And the noun would be pregnancy. That's P-R-E-G-N-A-N-C-Y. How do you know if you're pregnant? Well, you can take a pregnancy test. But whether you would trust the home pregnancy test or not, I don't know. Uh, Lynn, did you take a pregnancy test? Yes, I did. <laughs> Was it a home pregnancy test? Well, first I took a home pregnancy test and uh, my experience is that they were always reliable. But um, as, as soon as I had the positive, then I went to the doctors and got a proper one, just to be sure. Okay, so did did you have any doubt though when you had the result of the test? Did you did it cross your mind to think, oh, do I really trust this? Well, <laughs> not really. I think they're very reliable. Okay, uh, yeah, I think they're reliable. I suppose it depends on whether you want to be pregnant or not. <laughs> <laughs> Another expression you could use is to be expecting. Obviously, expecting a baby. So you could say, my wife's expecting. We're very happy now that my wife's expecting. Are there any colloquial expressions for pregnancy and people who are pregnant? Yes, you can say to have a bun in the oven. That's horrible, Razor. Is it horrible as well? <laughs> yeah? Well, it's, <laughs> it's a bit old-fashioned. What's though? bun in Spanish? Bun like Magdalena or... Magdalena. <laughs> yeah, is that what, Magdalena? Yeah, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a silly expression. It's not very common these but days. Is but is it is it insulting? Well, good question. Well, to have a bun in the oven, I don't think it's insulting, but it's a bit old-fashioned. Yeah, there. okay. There are more insulting ones. Yeah. I, I, I can think of even more old-fashioned ones, though. Mm -hmm. uh, to be in the family way, that's very old-fashioned, isn't it? Yeah, that's quite old-fashioned. That's something my, my parents would say, definitely. Mm -hmm. She's in the family way. Mm. Or to be expecting or waiting to hear the patter of tiny feet. You don't hear that often these days, do you? Well, I don't know. I've heard that. Yeah? But yeah. Would patter be something like this? Patter, yeah. The patter, little, yeah. The patter of tiny <laughs> feet. A baby walking around. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to be really, really old fashioned, in fact, if you wanted to be so old fashioned, it sounds laughable, you could say to be with child. But you wouldn't in a modern conversation. But you might read it in old literature. In the Bible, for example, you might read, Mary was with child as she traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's the typical kind of expression you get in the, in the Bible talking about the birth of Jesus. To be with child. It's a nice euphemism for to be pregnant. Mm -hmm. So when a woman is pregnant, then there's a date when the baby is expected to be born. So you could ask the question, when's the baby due? D-U-E. When is it due? So that's strange, isn't it? You use the word it to refer to the baby. Why do you think that is? Because it's a person, even though it's inside the body. I think it's because you just don't, well, you didn't used to know um, whether it was going to be a boy or a girl. So you said it. But now people do often know the sex of the babies before they arrive. And how do they know that? Well, they know that through the scans. I knew it. And when my friends knew it, then they would ask me, when are they due? Because I was expecting twins the first time. Oh, wow. And then for my third daughter, they knew it was a little girl. And then they said, when is she due? But that's because they knew it was a girl beforehand. 
Okay. Yeah. So some people are not very keen on knowing the sex of the child, if it's a boy or a girl. Why do you think that is? You, you wanted to know, did yes, you? Yes, yes, we did. Uh-huh. Yeah. I wonder why people don't want to know. Probably they want a surprise. Yeah, yeah, they want to be surprised. Mm-hmm. But um, I found when you saw the babies on the scan that they really, for me, they became babies. So they became little people already. We had to refer to them with names. And especially because the first time I had twins, so we had to distinguish which one was which one. <laughs> and you could see that from the scan. Yes. Uh-huh. And they always, one was always on the top and one was always on the bottom. So I always knew which was which. <laughs> How many weeks pregnant were you when you had the scan? Do you remember? Uh, well, you have lots of scans, but it, I mean, for me, it was quite a while ago now because my daughters are 18, but I think it was around 15, 16 weeks when they could really, I think though, actually even at 10 or 11 weeks, if they're lucky and they get a good angle on the baby, then they can tell then. But definitively, they kind of know around 15, 16 weeks. Yeah. When you talk about scans, I Mm. I guess you're talking about ultrasound. That's right, ultrasound. How does that work exactly? How do they do it? Oh, well, they have a, you get a bit of jelly, sort of like a transparent jelly is smeared on your skin. And then they have like a handheld scanner, which scans across your tummy. And then you see the picture on the screen. And now um, I heard last week from a, a student in one of my classes that now they actually have 5D scans. 5D? 5D scans. So the quality of the image must be incredible. Well, it, I, I've never heard of 5D. I've only heard of 3D. Me too. When I, when I was pregnant, I had a 3D scan, but that was the state of the art technology then. But now apparently they have 5D scans, so I don't know what that is. Well, uh, the next word I'm not even going to try and pronounce. Um, what is it? Ah, amniocentesis. Amniocentesis. <laughs> <laughs> I have problems too. <laughs> amniocentesis. Amniocentesis. What's that? Yeah. Well, that's a test that um, a lot of people are given in a routine way now. And it's a test that you have. But what they do is they put a little needle through your tummy and um, they extract a a small quantity of the amniotic fluid, which is the fluid which is in the the fetal sac, the sac that the baby is lying in. Is that like the food that the baby's... Um, No, it's not the food because the food comes through the placenta, through the umbilical cord. Okay. That's the way the baby gets the nutrients. So this is fluid around the baby. the, The baby is protected in a bag and the bag is filled with fluid. I presume it's to protect the baby from bumps and things, Mm -hmm. I imagine. But anyway, they extract a tiny little extract of this amniotic fluid and then they can analyse that in the lab. They can tell you definitively what the sex of the baby is because they, they're able to detect, I presume, the chromosome or something. Mm-hmm. You get an absolute definite idea of the sex. And they also examine it and they can detect some sort of genetic disorders. So people often use it to detect whether the health of the baby is good or not. Right. Yeah. Sometimes babies are born before the time. Reza, what's that word in, in English? Premature. Premature, that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, the normal pregnancy uh, period is nine months, yeah? Uh, actually, the doctors calculate it always in weeks. So they say 40 weeks is full that's term it. because I think they probably count it from the date of inception. I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not really sure. But they usually say 40 weeks. So if you're if the baby's born before 40 weeks, then they count it as premature. So with, with premature, you've got the prefix pre, which means before, and similarly in prenatal, pre again is before, so prenatal or antenatal before giving birth. Mm-hmm. And what if the 40 weeks has finished and the baby still isn't born? What do they do mm. these days? Well, normally they wait and they see if the baby's getting in position because they're never, of course, absolutely certain that they're counting the weeks correctly. They estimate the weeks from the size of the baby in the scans. But they'll wait for a, sometimes two weeks or even longer if the baby's still small. If the baby is not in the right position and it doesn't look like the baby is coming and they believe from the scans it's time, then what they might do is they might induce the birth and then they give you some drugs. Is induce the same as similar in Spanish? 
yeah, induce theories. Induce theories. Induce theories, yeah. I think so, yeah. So they'll induce the birth. So they, they give you some medicine and then that starts the contractions and they'll start the process that way. Right. Or they might decide if the baby's not in the right position, they might decide that you need to have a cesarean or a C-section. What is the right position? The right position is that the head of the baby has to move down into the birth canal. So it has to basically be head first. <laughs> So, of course, if the baby is born before the date, it's premature and it might need to be in an incubator. That's right. What does an incubator do? What's the purpose of an incubator? Well, some of the problems that they have when they're born, it depends how how soon they're born, how premature they are. If they're just a couple of weeks or two or three weeks before the date, then often the problem is, is simply they can't keep their body temperature correct. So they put them in this little sort of uh, crib where the, the temperature is controlled. What's a, what's a crib? Um, a crib is kind of like a little bed for a baby. Baby Jesus was in a crib. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, he was in a manger as well, but probably not in, a, in an incubator. Not in an incubator. But then the incubators, of course, have other functions. So, if the baby's heartbeat needs to be monitored, or if it's receiving any kind of medication, especially babies that are very, very premature, then often they have to have food intravenously and and things like that. It's kind of like cooking them a bit more. That's right. Yeah. It's like it, it, it popped out of the oven a bit too soon. So it's like, well, let, let's give it a bit of time in the microwave and that will finish it off. Kind of thing, yeah? Well, if you take your, your, if you take your expression to have a bun in the oven, maybe it's, maybe it's giving the opportunity for the bun to rise, you yeah. could say. Inten intensive care for babies. Do you remember, Lynn, when you, with your pregnancies, did, mm -hmm. did you feel bad in the mornings? That's called morning sickness. No, I didn't. Thank you goodness. You were very no. lucky. I, I remember I only had with the twins, I had one morning when I experienced what I believe is morning sickness. But I think I was really, really lucky because I remember on that morning, I felt absolutely terrible, very nauseous. It was really horrible. So I, I do feel sorry for everybody who suffers. Um, I think the... The princess, the new princess, well, the Kate, Kate yeah. Middleton, the, the Duchess of Cranebridge, isn't yeah, she? That's yeah, what the Duchess is. of Cranebridge. When she, in all three pregnancies, she's got an illness, which means that she has excessive morning sickness. So she has it practically permanently. I think morning sickness for most people, you only get it through one of the terms of the pregnancy and it's the very first. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, some people can be really unlucky with it. But I was very lucky. I've only had it once, one morning. So I got off lightly. So this expression to have a baby, you can also say to, to give birth, which is really, really nice in Spanish. Dar luz is a lovely expression to give. You say to give light. Yeah, that's lovely in Spanish. I but in English, actually. it's more common to say to have a baby mm -hmm. or to give birth. But Reza, it's a bit confusing, this verb to bear a child. Can you explain it a bit more? Yes, I certainly can. We all can, I'm sure, as, as English teachers, because we, we often hear it misused, don't we? To bear a child, B-E-A-R. That's what a pregnant woman does. She bears a child. That's not the same as also, is it? No, but it's the same spelling, but uh, it's not the same <laughs> meaning. Yeah, we're not talking about, we're not having, uh, we're talking about ositos here. No, we're talking about bearing children. B-E-A-R, and it's irregular. The past is bore, B-O-R-E, and the past participle born. That's the word that interests most of us, born, the past participle. You say, for example, I was born in Ireland. I was born in Ireland. Not I born, uh-uh, that's a classic mistake. It's I was born because it's passive. When, whenever I was born, I didn't do anything. My mum did all the work. <laughs> she did the work. I merely arrived. The poor woman had to push and do a lot of work. So I was born by my mother would be the full expression. But of course, we don't say by my mother because it's obvious because no one else can physically bear you. It's impossible. So we don't say it. But it's a passive construction. I was born. Lynn, where, where were you born? I was born in Sunderland in England, the northeast of England. Yeah. Would you say your accent is from there? A little bit, yes. People usually detect that I'm from the northeast. Yeah. I like your accent. I really like accents from the northeast of England a lot. I like it too, yeah. And sometimes Lynn's accent comes out, Sally, comes out more than others. Yes. And when it comes out, I really, really like it. So <laughs> today, on today's podcast, you have a Belfast accent, a London accent, 
And would you say a, a Tyneside well, no, accent? No, 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 no. We're on the on the River Weir, so my accent is a Mackham accent. Um, um, a Mackham. A Mackham accent. Mm-hmm. Sunderland used to be famous for shipbuilding. Right. And um, there was a period at the beginning of the last century where they were the, the, the most efficient shipbuilding area. They produced lots of ships in a very short time. And there used to be an expression, Mackham and Tackham, which was used to make them and take them. Oh, right. And that's where Mackham comes from, I believe. Oh, wow. <laughs> but maybe you'll get lots of listeners oh. writing in contradicting me. I don't know. <laughs> but we're, we're on the River Weir. Sunderland's on the River Weir. Newcastle's on the River Tyne. So your Tyne side accent is from people who live on the river. If you've ever been to that part of the UK, then uh, let us know. Send us a message and we'll pass it on to, on to Lynn. Another expression you could use for having a baby while you're having a baby is to be in labour. Notice the preposition in, to be in labour. I know where that comes from. That's because it's very hard work. (laughs) (laughs) So the labour, I think, has to do with the hard work that the woman has to go through. What's the name of the person who helps you while you are in labour? That's the midwife. Isn't it? Isn't that a funny word the first time you hear it? Midwife, because wife is esposa, mujer. So midwife, it's kind of like this woman in the middle. Yeah. She's not the wife. She's not the one having the baby, but she's kind of in the middle between the man and the mother, the midwife. Yeah, she's very important. So I guess that's why we call it midwife, right? (laughs) No, it's actually an old English word. It's a very old English word, which means with woman. Because ah, the mid wow. come for in old English is with. Oh, so that's it's like the, German, wow. yeah. It's oh. like mit. In like German, mit, mit so yeah. it's with the woman. You've oh. blown my mind there. Yeah, I would never great. have guessed that in a million years. Wow, that's very that's fascinating. That's that's particularly interesting because we got Lynn here, who is a fluent German speaker, by the way. <laughs> that's right. As it as it happens. <laughs> but I didn't know midwife was mit <laughs> ah. either. What's the name of these pains that women get while they're in labour and giving birth? Oh, no. Yeah. Husbands. <laughs> husbands. <laughs> husbands who know better. <laughs> Those very sharp pains that come every few seconds or every few minutes. What are they called? Oh, you're leaving that one for me. That's the, They're the contractions. Yeah, the contractions. And on a scale of one to ten, how painful are they? Oh, well, they ask you that during the labour process. Yes, of course they do. So they ask you, and that that determines a little bit about what painkillers they might give you. Does it also let them know how close to the birth of the baby it's becoming? If oh, that's the that's the frequency of the contractions. The frequency of the contractions uh, tells you if a the lot, baby's coming uh-huh. out. If the yeah. ba- if the and also the um, I mean, what the doctors uh, measure is the dilation. And what do they give you if the baby's not coming out, if the baby wants to stay inside because it's nice and warm? What do they give you to induce the pregnancy? I'm not sure what kind of med- – it's, it's a kind of drug. Oh, no, I thought – sorry, I thought it was epidural. That's not for that, is it? <laughs> no, no. Epidural's for pain, <laughs> is it? I have no, no. no idea about this. No, these it's words. obvious you've never had a baby, Craig. I have never <laughs> had a baby. No, well, an epidural is what they give you. It's a type of painkiller. Right. So – there's a, is that the one that goes in the back, in the spine? That's the one that goes in the spine. Is it it's painful? A very, no, but it's a very delicate procedure. You have to have a very good anaesthetist who knows how to lay, lay the needle well. Yeah. You have to be very, very still when they put the needle in because if they make a mistake, of course, they're injecting directly into your the spinal spine. cord. Yeah. So that's a bit tricky when you're having contractions to actually stay very, very still. Right. But believe me, you want to try (laughs) because I had an epidural just the first birth and uh, it was marvellous because I didn't feel a thing. Wow. Uh But not for the second? Not for the second, no. No, for the first birth, they had to induce me. And the first birth were the twins? The first birth was the twins and they had to induce me because I didn't have any contractions, but I was dilating. Mm -hmm. So the doctor was worried that 
the the babies I could give birth and the the waters might break. Have you heard that expression? The what does waters that mean? Break. Waters breaking. Well, first of all, often when childbirth starts, we mentioned earlier the amniocentesis test. Uh-huh. Yes. Where you're taking the fluid from the sacs. Right. Well, that fluid just before birth, when the baby's pushing down, it breaks the sac. And so what happens is your waters break. Oh, right. And that's a sign that you're about to start to give birth, that the labor process is starting. That's when you're very close to actually that's the when baby's you're very coming close, out. Yeah. yeah. And then often for some women, the waters break first and then the contractions start later. For other women, the contractions start and then the waters break. Mm-hmm. In actual fact, in my case, I didn't have contractions or breaking of the waters, but unfortunately it looked like the babies were going to come out. I think it was just that they were so, I had so much baby inside my tummy. I had two. That the force of gravity was forcing them. Forcing them out. So the doctor decided to do a cesarean section. Right. And then they have to break the waters. Manually. Uh, manually. And um, they gave me an epidural so that I could be awake during the birth, during the C-section. So my husband was there. Was your husband there for both births? Yes. Uh-huh. In the delivery yes. room? In the delivery room, yes. What were his thoughts after? How did he feel? When you spoke to him after the first time? The first one was fine. We were very nervous, but of course I was in no pain. The babies were delivered. The people were marvellous and that was great. So he was fine and and I was fine and we were very excited to Mm -hmm. see the children. The second childbirth experience I had with my third daughter was the more traditional one. So I got contractions and then I actually started contractions when I crashed my six week brand new old car in the garage and when I crashed it and I was very upset that's when my contractions started and then six hours later the birth went very quickly for that pregnancy I had no painkiller whatsoever you didn't have an epidural no because there was no time and I didn't get any other pain relief so you had the full experience I had the full experience and I was glad it was over quickly because it was quite painful. (laughs) And was your husband's reaction the same after seeing that than the first one? No, not at all. He was very distressed. He was as distressed as I was because it's quite quite an experience. But you get through it, so it's no problem. And it's nice to be there. Yeah, it was nice that he was there with me. It's a stereotype, it's a cliche that when women are giving birth, particularly if they're having a painful birth, as you did the second time, the stereotype is that they get rather angry with um, their husband or the man who got them pregnant. Is is that true? It's like, don't come near me again. (laughs) Yeah, I I remember. Don't touch me again. (laughs) I actually had a friend who I remember, she said that she deliberately grew her nails so that when she was holding her husband's hand, she was having her fourth (laughs) child with him. (laughs) That she could deliberately she, inflict pain. <laughs> dig her nails into his Which was his quite arm. something. Yeah. yeah. I can't know. Make it them didn't... nice and sharp. Exactly. No, I, th- I honestly, when I was having my painful birth, that was the last thing on my mind. I was only focused on, please, can my baby come quickly and can this all be over? Was it a long birth? No, it wasn't. I was really lucky. I mean, that's why I didn't have painkillers because it was yeah. going very fast. So, no, I was really lucky. It was over quick. That's one good thing. <laughs> of course, when the baby comes, out of the womb there's a cord that connects the baby to the mother so Reza what happens with that cord they cut the cord that's the expression you've got to cut the cord cut the umbilical cord but first they have to tie it that's really important oh they tie it first they have to tie it first because or they clip it because if they don't, then you'll bleed to death. The mother will bleed oh, of to course. death. Oh, so wow. it's very, very important because everybody says on the movies and everything, oh, cut the cord, cut the cord. But I always thought to myself, my goodness, imagine you had a birth at home and somebody didn't know and attempted to cut the cord. It could be really dangerous. I wouldn't know that. No, no it, it can be neither. very, very dangerous. So you have to, the, the cord is clipped, I think. And that expression to cut the cord can be used for other uses. For example, you could say if when your children leave home yes. and start a new life at university or they move out, you can say that they've cut the cord, they've cut the family cord. Mm-hmm. And also with uh, these days with the internet, you can stop having your TV with your cable company and that's also cutting the cord. Cord cutters are people who use the internet for their entertainment and not for Movie Star TV, for example, or Ono TV that we have here in Spain. So you're cutting the cord or the connection with your 
telephone company or internet provider. Now, unfortunately, not all pregnancies go according to plan, sadly, and uh, you might have a miscarriage. Can you explain what to miscarry means to the, the listeners? Well, to miscarry is when you're pregnant and then um, for some reason, nobody really knows. There's lots of different reasons why it can be, but it seems that the baby is not developing properly and the body starts the labour but the baby isn't actually mature. So a lot of women miscarry in the first 12 weeks mm -hmm. before the fetus is really very big at all. I mean, you can't really see very much. So to have a miscarriage is when it's a natural, unfortunate event, really, where you lose the baby mm -hmm. through nature. The other word that is important in English is abortion. Because I think um, in Spanish, people say aborto for miscarriage and abortion. Right. But in English, we say miscarriage when it's an, a natural event. And we say abortion when it's an intervention that's been de desired by the, by the woman. Yeah, that's an important clarification. Mm -hmm. Apparently, I read that between 10 and 20% of pregnancies end in, in miscarriages, which is which is really sad. Yeah, but I, I remember they say that a, a lot more women miscarry within the first month and don't actually even realise that they were pregnant. Yeah. Another expression I've heard about uh, births not going according to plan is a stillbirth. But is that the same as a miscarriage? No, that's not. That's when um, the baby dies in the sack, in the womb. Obviously, the baby at that stage... For a stillbirth, the baby is a fully formed baby. But it still has to come out. But it has to be, you have to give birth and it's born dead. And that's called a stillbirth. So the baby was alive up to shortly before birth. It could be shortly before or it could have died a couple of days before. We, nobody really knows. But obviously the doctors induce the labour. And when the labour's induced and you give birth to, unfortunately, a dead baby, then that is a stillbirth. I guess we say a, a stillbirth, a stillborn baby, because still means with no movement. With no so the movement, baby's not that's moving. Right. Right. And when the baby is born, the baby needs to be fed. So you could feed the baby with mother's milk, breastfeed the baby, or you could use a synthetic way of feeding, which is, is that called formula milk? Yes, it's not, it's not synthetic, it's formula milk. <laughs> but what does that mean though, formula well, milk? Well, formula milk is usually a powdered milk. And it's a, it's a milk powder, which, you, yes, it's natural. I think, well, there are many different forms now, but I mean, it's a, it's a sort of mixture, I think, originally of cow's milk, which has got different sort of additives to it to be nutritious for the baby. And you mix that with water. Mm -hmm. And then it's fed to the baby in a bottle, in a baby's bottle. And there were problems as well in Africa because there was a lot of formula milk sold in Africa. And the, the formula milk was clean and fine and to standard. But the problem was that if you, it was mixed with contaminated water, then, of course, it was very, very bad for the children. Sure. And, of course, in many places in Africa, getting clean water, sterile water, is difficult. So there was a big backlash against selling formula milk in Africa. What's a backlash? A backlash. There was sort of a... Um, revolt? A, a revolt. Because they said it was much healthier and much more in the interests of child mortality if women breastfed, because the breast milk from breastfeeding is, of course, sterile always. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it has the exact nutrients that uh, the babies need. So if you have a choice and you haven't got clean water, then um, it's actually safer to go with one, breastfeeding. One interesting thing for me about breastfeeding is the different cultural acceptance of it because I've been to Africa and I've seen women breastfeeding babies on the bus in, in restaurants and it's completely natural and completely normal. That would not necessarily be true in here in Europe. What do you think about that? I, I've seen it occasionally, mm -hmm. but not often in public. There are countries that really push it. I mean, I had my twins in Germany and they really, really uh, promoted breastfeeding. Did you see women breastfeeding in public in Germany? They, they had spaces where you could go and breastfeed. I mean, it is difficult, but it was, it was accepted-ish. I think it's more accepted now. Uh, it's more public. Here in Spain, where I had my third daughter, 
I didn't feel that there were a lot of spaces uh, where you could breastfeed comfortably Mm -hmm. and there weren't spaces set aside. But I think that's changing a little bit now because I think people are seeing the value of breastfeeding. The problem with breastfeeding is that it's not compatible, really, if you're having to go back to full time work because you have to breastfeed every three, four hours. Yeah. So it can be quite complicated. But companies are trying to make it possible now. How did you cope? How did you manage with um, the twins? Did you breastfeed both of them? Yes, I did for about eight months. Wow, that must have been hard work, really tiring. Well, it was, but it was, it got easier. It was very, very difficult in the first two months because, well, if you're on your own, you can imagine, they both tended to cry at the same time because they were both hungry at the same time. But you can't feed them at the same time. You have to feed one, then the other. No, you can feed them at the same time, but I needed help because somebody has to hand me the babies and then I could feed them simultaneously. So when my husband was there, it was no problem. But when he was at work and I was at home, I had some very stressful moments because whenever I was feeding one, the other one was was crying. crying. When they could hold their heads up themselves... Then I started getting ingenious and I used to sit them on the sofa and I had them in position position so that I could with two hands manage at the same time. But that was a bit tricky. (laughs) I have to ask, I'm very curious, Uh does it hurt? Does breastfeeding hurt? No. Well, uh, not really, no. no. No, Unless you have a... There's no teeth. The babies don't have teeth. Well, some some of them do, but I often wondered that. But some some babies do get teeth very, very early. Mine didn't. I wouldn't like to imagine that. So what's the age of consent in Spain? And do you agree with it? What do you think the age of consent should be? Well, I don't know what it is. Do you know, Lynn, what the age of consent for sexual intercourse is in Spain? I have no idea. I'm sorry, I don't. It's 16 at the moment. Uh And this might surprise you. It certainly surprised me. It used to be 13 up until 2015. I knew it was. I knew it was lower, and they raised Spain it. Spain had the lowest age really? of consent in wow. Europe only three years ago. I knew wow. that. Yeah, wow. the reason they they I think what I heard was they kept that in place. This is not being racist. It's a simple fact. Is because of gypsies. Because uh, gypsies insisted that in their culture it was normal to get married and have babies at fourteen or fifteen years old. Wow. So they kept the law like that so that gypsies could legally have children at that age. The only country in Europe that was lower than that before 2015 was the Vatican that was 12 and still is 12. My goodness. And of course the Vatican (laughs) Vatican is a separate country. Uh Yeah. So Lynn, you could tell us this, in what ways should a a woman change her lifestyle during her pregnancy? What advice can you give? Well. Obviously no (laughs) drinking, no smoking. Yes, no drinking, no smoking. I mean. uh, What what about fashion? Does that get affected? (laughs) Well, you get to buy new clothes because your old ones don't fit. <laughs> so that's a good excuse to go shopping. <laughs> no, they have nice, they have nice pregnancy wear. I mean, I don't think I changed too many things. I was quite active until the end. I used to still go rollerblading. I remember going to a party once and skipping. I don't know whether that was sensible or not, but I did. <laughs> Dancing, you can do everything. I mean, as long as you're healthy. If, I mean, obviously, if you're suffering from morning sickness or you have any complications, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Oh, and were you working during before both pregnancies? Yeah. And if so, how long before you gave birth did you stop work? Well, the twins came one month early and I gave up work two weeks before they were born. But I was quite big then. So the twins, it was a, it was a heavy pregnancy, obviously, because it was two babies. I didn't really have to change my life very much. I do remember that in the night, though, I used to often wake up. I had a lot of sleepless nights and it was because when my back started to ache and I wanted to turn over, I had to literally lift my stomach to turn over (laughs) (laughs) because it was too big. (laughs) Did you have more back problems with the twins because there's twice the weight? Yes, because there was a lot of weight. There was an awful lot of weight. I mean, in the the twins, I think I had to carry an extra 20 kilos, Wow, which was a lot. (laughs) Did you have any special cravings? Cravings are antojos when you were pregnant. 
No, I didn't. I think I was atypical, you see. I didn't have morning sickness and I didn't have cravings. I did miss having a drink now and again. <laughs> but I tried to obviously not because it's not uh, it's not a good idea when you're pregnant to drink any alcohol. I mean, I was surprised because at the time before I had my twins, I used to be an occasional smoker. And I thought I would miss cigarettes, but actually the smell of cigarettes made me feel really uncomfortable. Maybe that was the mother's protective instincts so, protecting uh, the baby. So that was the only thing I think where I felt different. I didn't have a craving for food particularly. I missed occasionally being able to have a glass of wine. I did miss, but I didn't have a craving for it. But I thought, oh, I, I can't wait until I can have a glass of wine again. <laughs> Had to wait another year because you can't have wine even when you're breastfeeding, really. Of course, because the no, alcohol no. might, yeah. You have your nine months and then you might have another eight or another year or however until long you, you decide stop to, breastfeeding. until you stop breastfeeding. Right. So I was happy when I could have my first glass of wine. But the smoke, I couldn't stand being around the smell of nicotine. It really re revolted me, which surprised me because I had been an occasional smoker up to that point. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that there are certain foods that some people think you should avoid if you're pregnant, such no, that's as true. undercooked mushrooms and yeah, eggs and things. And, Is there uh, any truth? And raw milk, yes. Raw you have milk. to stay away from any product made with raw milk. So there was a, I, I'm a real cheese addict. And there was quite a few cheeses that I used to like that were made with unpasteurized milk. Is that dangerous? It's very dangerous when you're pregnant. Why? There's a toxicological Ill illness that you can get and it can cause miscarriage. So you've got to be very, very careful. It can damage your... The mi is it microbes? The microbes. Uh -huh. In unpasteurized milk, you could have any cheese that was made with pasteurized milk, but not with raw milk. So we've spoken a little about um, the woman's experience in pregnancy. What mm -hmm. advice would you give any men listening of how they should behave if their wife or, or girlfriend's pregnant? Well, just to be sort of kind and um, attentive, really. My husband was really good to me all the time. He just did it naturally. He could see when I couldn't tie my shoelaces anymore and he used to do it for me. <laughs> uh, so that was quite nice. That was with the, when I was pregnant with the, the twins. I just couldn't bend down to tie my shoelaces. So he would do that. Was he very calm and very collected, which means very um, stable yes, when yes. when you were in labour, like getting you to the hospital, oh, for example? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Didn't, but I think he didn't panic? No, that's it's kind of his personality. So you can't really, I, I think it's hard for people to adapt their own personality. For a person that naturally panics, then possibly you will panic. Yeah. But you just all have to try your best. Everybody tries their best. And that's the main thing, I think. Then um, imagine Mother Nature. That means nature. We say yeah. English Mother Nature because, you know, your mom gives birth to you and nature gives birth to us all, I guess. Imagine Mother Nature turned the tables, had reversed the situation, and it was men who got pregnant. Not women. Do you think we could handle it? I'm would sure we moan a lot more? Would we be terrible? We complain when we have a cold. How would we give birth? Come on. I'm sure you would. I, I believe in Mother Nature. You know, before I had children, I didn't think I would cope with the pain. And even now, when I look back, I still can't believe that that was me. But I think nature just equips you with the resilience you need. So I'm sure it will be the same for men. I'm sure you'd manage it if you had to. And who knows, maybe one day you will. Technology, medicine, it's I all advancing. I think that ship, that ship has passed. I think, <laughs> if the ship has passed, those days are behind us. For you. <laughs> for me. Oh, I thought you were talking to me. No. <laughs> I was talking about men in general. But oh, right. Sorry. Oh. I think maybe in the future, who knows, maybe yeah. it will be possible for men to have children. There's a, there's a point. I hadn't thought of that till you mentioned it. Uh, men, some men, of course, not all men, are physically, scientifically, biologically capable of producing children until there, there have been cases of 80 and 90 year old men doing it. It's not common. But it's oh, you mean to uh, how, produce, okay. be able to, to get someone pregnant. To get somebody pregnant, yeah, yeah to be to remain fertile. Yeah. But women generally stop being fertile, having the ability to be pregnant at well, at the very latest, about kind of 50 general, generally. Why do you think that's Mother Nature being sensible again? Or why? why is this? Is it fair? I have no idea. I mean, it's hard work having a baby and you have to be physically fit. Obviously, if you're carrying around the extra weight, when you're breastfeeding, you're feeding, all the nutrients are going out of your body. Do you feel weaker after you've breastfed? Oh, absolutely. Oh, you're exhausted. No, you don't feel weaker after you've breastfed, but you have to eat and drink healthily because you are drained of energy. I mean, not just through the breastfeeding, but also the sleepless nights and... 
and the the physical resilience you have to have to cope with the pain of childbirth, of the discomfort during pregnancy. But I mean, lots of women now, there are women who have had babies, I believe, in their 60s now with IVF. IVF is intro vitro fertilization or in vitro fertilization. What's that? How does that work? And that's when they fertilize the egg, they extract the egg, they have the sperm donated by whoever. <laughs> it could be the partner or a, an anonymous sperm donor. Mm -hmm. And then the fertilized egg is implanted again inside the woman. And then she carries it to full term. Full term is when the time is up for the baby so that you can give birth to the baby. Wow. So she carries it to full term. And I think there have been cases in Italy of women who have been in their 60s who have given birth. Amazing. So that's oh. that physically it's possible whether it's a, whether it's something you would want to do is another question. Is it physically the most painful experience you've ever had? Physically? Uh, so far, yes. <laughs> But who knows? I hope it's the last. <laughs> But yes, I would say yes. Not the not the first one because it was a cesarean, so it was easy. Uh, it was very uh, enjoyable. But the the real childbirth, yes, I would say that was the most painful. Well, Rezo, I'm pleased we were born men. Yes, me too, I have to say. <laughs> Incredible admiration for women going through that. At heart, we are cowards. We yes. are frightened. <laughs> So what are your thoughts on pregnancy? Please let us know. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us as always on SpeakPipe at speakpipe.com slash English podcast. So why not practice your English? Tell us about your pregnancy experiences or any other thoughts you have about having babies and practice your speaking. One final recommendation before we go. This uh, subject was inspired by Luke's English podcast, episode 502, in which our friend Luke speaks about the birth of his daughter. So there's a link to that podcast in the show notes to this episode at englishpodcast.com slash 211. It's very well worth listening to. Lynn, thank you very much for joining us for this podcast. We really appreciate you helping us with um pregnancy vocabulary and your experiences you're welcome thank you very much for having me thanks Len. thanks a lot so if you'd like to send us an email you can reach me craig at inglespodcast.com or belfastreza at gmail.com and before we go we'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors starting with bruno our gold sponsor on patreon who through his company walking tours of copenhagen provide walking tours of that wonderful city in english and in Spanish. So for more information, go to copenhagenwalkingtour.com. And Bruno also has tours of Rio, Rio de Janeiro, particularly the favela area. So you're led around by local guides. It's very safe. And it also helps the community by giving back income to help their daily needs. You can find more information to that tour on Bruno's website at favelawalkingtour.com.br. But let's not forget all our other regular sponsors. We'd like to thank all of you who are... Ana Giovanna, Dana, Constantin, Pachi, Manuel, Juan Carlos, Rodado, Beatriz, Pedro, Maite, Lara, Rafa, Banzels, Nestor from Luces Estrañas, Maria, Lorena, Sara, Jarabo, Carlos, Garrido, Mamen, of course, Juan, Leiva, Guerrera, Cory Finneran with the baseball podcast IVMV.com, Miren, José Luis, Agus, Mariel, Manuel, García, Betagón, Raúl, Rafael, José Manuel, Pilar, Altinez, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Combate Blog, Igor, Ignacio, Kieran, Ana, Marina, Juan Carlos, Joel, Alejandro, Alex, José Emilio, Emilio Manuel Martínez Rivas, Chama Santa Cruz, Ana Fernández, Carlos Caño Domingo, Gustavo, Eva Maria, Arminda, Fafo, José Eduardo, and our latest patrons, Carlos Sánchez and Elvira Cortez. And finally, last but not least, Francisco Javier Alejandre Sebastián. And as a footnote, which means something I've added on, Carlos sent a message to say thank you for providing the transcriptions to the podcast. I'm sure I'll improve my English even more now that I have access to the transcriptions. So if you're interested to join that list and have access to our transcriptions for as little as $1 per month, you get instant access on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash 
And thanks as always to the transcription artiste, Angelica Bello from Madrid, who lovingly transcribes the podcasts for you. Also, thank you to Patricia Alonso, who's working hard to transcribe the initial episodes right back at the beginning. We have 1 to 22 transcribed, thanks to Patricia, and also 131 to 142. Reza, what's on next week's episode? On next week's episode, you can hear all about the words still and yet. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The amniocent... The, sorry. The bags that the baby are in, which are full of this... Which are full of this... <laughs> The fetal sorry, sacs. Sorry, sorry. The, fe- the fetal sacs. Will you find the fetus? Yes. Sorry. We'll start again. Let's start again. So.